So this is an example from Malawi. Malawi, yes. Mm -hmm. Mondia Waite. It's called Gondolose in local language. Mm -hmm. It's an aphrodisiac. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Is it yeah. three or no, a small? It's a, it's a scrambler. It's uh, like a liana. Like uh -huh. liana yeah. uh, this one is one of the ones we saw that it's traded in Brussels. Yeah. So it's imagine, uh, eh? I can tell you it doesn't grow in Brussels, eh? So it comes from uh, maybe Malawi. Malawi, yeah. We, it's, it's widely traded and now I think it's vulnerable, but... It's listed vulnerable now? Yeah. Okay. And it's found in the forest or more maybe the savanna forest. woodland? In more forest, eh? More forest, but hmm? it's harvested quite Hi extensively. Highly, yeah. Yeah. And of course. If it makes it to Brussels, imagine, eh? Yeah. It's, it's uh, valuable. Mm -hmm. But I think it should be under... Mm -hmm. uh, it should be reclassified in terms of ICM mm -hmm. reg to regulate the trade. Yeah, we can check that. Mm -hmm. Another example? Ooh. So this example is from, from Rwanda. From Rwanda? Uh, Eritrina Abyssinica. Eritrina Abyssinica, yeah. Uh, it is uh, locally known as Umuko. Mm -hmm. uh, the local people use uh, the bark of its roots. Uh, to mix with other plants to cure uh, uh, liver. Liver problems. Liver problems. Oh. Mm -hmm. Eritrina absinica is widespread in Africa. I know it's found in East Africa and Southern Africa, so yeah, Malawi as well. Yeah. yeah. In some parts they cultivate it. Yeah. It's so important they start planting it in their farms mm -hmm. because it makes money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. One more example? Yeah. Yes. In from Tanzania? From Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can call it, uh, they used it, it as a food, but also as a medi medicine. It's a, this it yams. Yams, wild yams? Oh. But yeah, their roots are used as food, but the leaves are used as the medicine. So, so, so the roots of these wild yams are used as food, yes. but the leaves for medicine. Medicine. And I think uh, our food also in West Africa, I think, mm -hmm. because the the traditional, we use them as traditional food, especially in the northern part of Tanzania. Ah. Yeah. So and where is it found? In the forest or more in the savanna? In savanna. In savannas? Yeah, ah. some of them are also found in the forest. Okay, so different species yeah, maybe. It's the climber. Is yeah, ah, yeah, yeah, scramble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, climber. the leaves are used for, to cure, I mean, diseases, stomach diseases. For yeah. adults or just children? Uh, especially for adults. Well. For grown-ups. Yeah, yeah. But also we have for trees. Mm -hmm. The bark of, I don't know the scientific name of it, but they, it's not for, for medicine, but they're used for local beer. Yeah. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That's a good point, yeah. yeah. There's some other uh, yeah. plants eh, that they used to flavor local drinks. Yeah, local drinks. And that's so also important. Eh? This is typical. I mean, very good yes. point. So yeah. it's, it's between food and medicine. So eh? It gives flavor. The, the bugs, and they put and it, they put it in there, no. to help the yeah. fermentation yeah. and the flavor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very good point. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> One more example from Benin. From Benin. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think uh, it is a widespread species. Its name? Kaya Senegalensis. Kaya Senegalensis. Yes, West Africa only. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. In the drylands of West Africa is a big tree. Okay. Mm -hmm. And people use its leaves uh -huh. to cure malaria and other... The bark also is yeah, used for malaria. So yeah. To cure digestion problems. Also. Digestion problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is a tree found in the savanna? I know this one. Lots of research on it. And the leaves are used to cure malaria and the bark is used to cure stomach problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, the leaves are used for animals as fodder. Very important tree in West Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I also oh. forgot the one that I want. Okay, just one more, eh? Because we need to continue. Yeah, one more. No, but you already said. Let me. <laughs> 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 we can have it in coffee break. So, one more example from. From Uganda. From Uganda. Uganda. Ah, Rwanda. Sorry. Yes, uh, I met one traditional hero. Mm -hmm. uh, he told me that they use ginseng. Ginseng plant. Yeah, ginseng. Yeah. Yes, ginseng. It's called mukuru in Kinyarwanda, mm -hmm. and it's used to heal the blood vessels disease, and sometimes in the ritual activities. Mm -hmm. They also use. Yes, and it's found in the eastern province. It's a, uh, what kind of. But it's cultivated. <laughs> eh? It's cultivated. Yes, yes. yes. But you see, it's a very good point. So some of the medicinal plants that are widely used, they're actually cultivated. Yes. So this is a very important source of income, but in a way, then, if we think about the sustainability, it might be better because they're already cultivating it. It's not from wild environments. 
they use roots during their yeah. uh, medicine preparation. Yeah, so the part they use is the roots. Yes. But maybe they just harvest part of it, so the rest of the plant can continue growing. Yes. It depends on the way. Yeah. Good. Sorry. Okay, last example. Eh? We need to move on. Yes. From Uganda this time. Yes. My example is Vanonia magdalena. Mm -hmm. It's commonly used to treat malaria. Uh -huh. So this is a bush. Yeah. It's not the big tree, it's a bush. It's a and it's, the leaves yeah. are used yes. to treat malaria. Mm -hmm. Vanonia magdalena. Uh, yeah. Malaria is very common in Uganda. Mm -hmm. so it's helpful to mm -hmm. rural people. So you see, malaria is a widespread disease in many parts of Africa. I guess the malaria treatment is not subsidized in Uganda. So local people use this bush, I guess pretty often. Yeah. So and it's the leaves. Uh, yeah. As uh, Liz said, also Mondia Hute is yeah. uh, commonly used. And uh, when you move around the streets of Kampala, you people can are see. hawking, hawking mm -hmm. the, the roots. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so we see, we can see from all over that it's, everybody use them. We've seen them in the markets. I mean, they're quite widespread. They're just often overlooked by the general assessments on ecosystem services. Sorry, let me, let's move on because we have a little bit more. But we can talk more about it off the coffee break. I really like it. So the second example today is about indigenous fruit trees. So indigenous fruit trees, it's not the mango, eh, let me tell you, or the avocado. It's trees that were locally found. Just, just a question, a quick one. Just yeah. How about cannabis? Is it not featuring in as one of the medicinal plants? Mm -hmm. it, is. it is. But my the question is, do you think it's sustainably harvested? <laughs> <laughs> it is cultivated to start with. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good. I never discuss if it's legal or illegal. Eh? <laughs> harvesting in some protected areas, harvesting medicinal plants is also illegal. Yeah. It doesn't mean it does not happen. So I think it's better to recognize what happens and try to first acknowledge how much is there so we see how we can deal with it. But yeah, widespread. I mean, even in Europe, eh? Yeah. So the next case now is about indigenous fruit trees. So indigenous fruit trees is not mango, is not avocado, is not orange, eh? It's the trees that were originally found in an environment and people use for food. And they're very important, especially for the food security. So we go back to that one. When there's a drought or when our crops fail, people turn to whatever is there. So now they might eat fruits that they didn't like too much before. And uh, indigenous fruit trees are also very important because they're high, many of them are high in nutrients or protein, especially the seeds. So they, they provide, um, it's not just the food security, but the nutrient security of the population. They can also provide income to local people and I'll show you some numbers and some are traded in the international markets and the first example okay sorry one more it's they can be found in different environments and in some areas they're starting to cultivate them in their agroforestry so they keep them in the farms and um, in the farms there's an interest in using indigenous fruit trees because they can help reduce soil erosion they can also provide shade so it depends on the crops we have, for example, if we have coffee or cocoa, we might be interested in having these trees that help us have shade in our crops. So there is my ex first example, because I think when we think about important indigenous fruit trees in Africa, the first time that, um, the first one that comes up is the baobab tree. So baobab tree has six times more vitamin C than oranges. Is the fruit in the whole world with highest vitamin C content. Widely spread in the drylands of Africa, it's been used for generations. You can use anything from the baobab tree, yeah? it's one of my favorite trees. So the leaves are cooked as a spinach, the bark of the trees is used to make ropes and baskets, it's also medicinal, the roots help you have this red dye. So those of you of West Africa, this is like the best tree, yeah? if you go to Senegal, Burkina, Mali, it's like Top, eh? Even people in Ghana and Benin will know that this is one of the best things. Eh? If when you talk about the local economy, it's like, yeah, the baobab tree. So I just want to point out that it's actually traded internationally. So you can get baobab products in Europe, in Canada, and in US. So I came actually recently from US, and every morning I was eating cereal of uh, baobab. I was so happy to find it in the supermarket. It's like, yes, 
you can see from here, we conquered the goal with the baobabs. So, I mean, the point is though is that it's still mostly harvest from the wild. So we also need to think about the sustainability of the harvest and the trade. So the Wallagher Forestry Center again is also trying to domesticate of some of these uh, indigenous fruit trees. Eh? The same idea, we try to select the trees that have the best characteristics and propagate it. So we're starting to turn the baobab tree in the next mango tree, eh? where you have lots of varieties and everybody can choose the best variety for their lo best local conditions. And just to have an idea on how it works. So many of these indigenous uh, fruit trees, they have a lot of variation in the wild. You can see a picture of baobab fruit, so you can see the different sizes, different shapes, even different percentage of protein content and size of seeds. So imagine, for example, there's this farmer that he rather have the big fruits because then he gets more pop, that's what he's selling. So he starts to plant the seeds from the fruits that have big, big pots and over generations we had the variation on the top, over the generation we may have two varieties the wild ones with a lot of them and some with the very big fruits so that's on a way but this process takes long time as well eh? and it requires a lot of trial and error so that's how traits can be selected by local farmers or by research institutions from Malawi and Kolike, the photo is from Malawi for the Baoba so what do we need to know to domesticate the tree or to start? So first we need to know what is the variation. So you can do research on variation in the, in this case the size of the fruits, but maybe if we are interested in the leaves, so the size of the leaves, the quantity of leaf, maybe the taste of the fruits in this case, we can also assess the nutritional properties. There's also variation. Some fruits, even if baobab has six times more vitamin C than orange, there's variation. Fruits from West Africa have more vitamin C than from South Africa, or maybe for those from Malawi have more vitamin C than those from South Africa. So we also need research on that. Of course, on how do we cultivate these things? I mean, the baobab tree usually takes 15 years to start fruiting in the wild. 15 years is a long time for a poor farmer. Eh? Mm -hmm. So if we can help this farmer plant a tree, and after one or two years, we graft it with a branch of a bigger tree, and then in five years, he's already producing. We help a lot his life. Because he can start selling fruits from five years instead of 15. Eh? So a lot of research needs to, needs to be done, or is being done in some cases, on how to cultivate and how to make these trees produce fruits faster. And of course, the next step is the value chain. It's great to have a lot of fruit, but if we cannot store it, clean it, package it, and sell it properly, we don't get a lot of money. So for the Baobab, for example, there's a, a few NGOs that help commercialize and export it to Europe. So I think it's um, very interesting to see that, that there's more indigenous fruit trees, and th there's been more research and there's more widespread um, the use in the drylands of Africa compared with the rainforest zone, that's where I work. And the answer is straightforward. Just why? Drylands, this is what exists. Yeah, in drylands we have few alternatives. Mm -hmm. Maybe the crops also fail more often. Yes. So we turn to the fruit trees more often. And I think another point is that in the rainforest zone, you compete with timber. Yeah. So if your trees is a bit like the one I show you, Aquamea, that is medicine. If the logging companies come and get a lot of money by cutting it for timber, nobody cares about these other uses that are more of maybe at the local level. So, 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 yeah. Uh, in terms of, I'm just thinking. Wait, wait, wait. Let me just come. Coming mm -hmm. from a drainage space, I mm -hmm. just realized that almost all the trees that I've met in that space is either food, fodder, or medicine. Mm -hmm. Could it be? Uh, selectively have been developed because the non-desirable uh, desirable trees were lost and then communities were only able to conserve the species that were useful to them? I think it's a very good question. My answer would be that everything has a use. Yeah. And we'll go back a little bit down the line that sometimes people find, they look for things. Yeah. So if I live in the rainforest and I have palm oil, yeah. I'll never bother going around and getting these small seeds, crushing yeah. them and getting oil yeah. to cook. But if I live in a place where there's nothing else, yeah, 
yeah. I'll spend the time eh? yeah. to look for the, my best tree to have the best seed oil and then I'll cultivate it or preserve it in the wild because there's no nothing else. So I think we also need to think what is the alternative. That's so drylands maybe less alternatives. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so so let's have some other examples on on uh, fruit trees. I guess this is another one that is pretty famous, Clerocaria virea. It's mostly found from East Africa to Southern Africa. It's a tree, smaller tree found in the savanna. It has medicinal properties, the seeds are eaten. The most famous use though is used to make this uh, alcoholic drink that it's exported and found everywhere in the world. You can find it in Europe, you can find it in US, I'm sure you can even find it in China. So it's mostly collected from the wild but little by little farmers, because it has a high value, they started to cultivate it. So it's in the process of domestication, a marula. Next example from West Africa, karité, shea butter. The seeds of this uh, tree are crushed and made into this paste that then it's made, made to make oil. It's locally used to cook, but now the value at the international market is so high. The people rather stop using it for cooking and start selling it for cosmetics. And I wanted to come down with my, my, the, my, the, my hand cream because actually my hand cream has karité. I just wanted to show you, sorry, but I forgot. So it's a very famous tree as well, karité, traded in huge numbers. And this one I think is very interesting because in West Africa, it's found from Senegal to more or less Nigeria. It's really highly valued. It's in the drylands, you can have nothing but this tree and it's precious. eh? Nobody bothers to touch it, even to cut a leaf to feed your goat, you never do that. But then it, I saw that in Uganda, also found in Uganda, people use it for charcoal. And when I read the publication, I was like, what? You know, you, people would kill you in West Africa if you were even there to cut a branch of this tree. And then we go back to the same thing, maybe because of alternatives. Wait, 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 one second, one second. A, a so the Uganda comment yeah. back on why people use charcoal that <laughs> from was a Shia. Walk from Kampala to northern Uganda, people protesting the overexploitation of the Shia, Shia butter tree. So it's being threatened there okay. because of charcoal burning. Mm -hmm. Because of the awareness that is coming up, people, the conservationists have risen up. Mm. You don't know, you would be making lots of money and you would just make it for charcoal. No, there are some ah. people who have started processing this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we can see that it's also what is the alternative or maybe there's lack of awareness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I waited that for that comment. <laughs> so another example, uh, now we move to the rainforest. Eh? And as I said, the problem in the rainforest is this competing value with timber. So the first example is Irvingia gabonensis, also found in Ghana and uh, yeah, all of West Africa, from Ghana to Benin and Cameroon. And uh, the seeds are used to make this kind of powdery paste. You make this sauce, super tasty, also medicinal, it's also used to, in cosmetics. And it's exported to Europe to make these pills that help you reduce weight. So trade it internationally as well. Guess how much? over 8 million US dollars in Cameroon only. So Cameroon produces, it trades 400 tons internally, about 3,000 to Nigeria, and I didn't put the numbers, about 2,000 to Equatorial Guinea and Gabon. So big numbers. And most of the Irvingia is still harvested from the wild. Big, big numbers. And I really like this figure. And we can see how the Irvingia is found in the, in the primary forest, it actually tolerates light, so it can be found in secondary forest. And look, so many in fallows and so many in farms. So what they do, the farmers there, is not that they plant it from seed. They go to the forest, when they find the seedling of the Irvingia, they bring it to their farm. Because when they grow, it's highly valued. So I think this is something we also need to think about. It's not just what people cultivate, but it's what people, we call it assisted regeneration. They go and get the seed that is already germinating and is starting to grow a little bit and we bring it home to our home garden or to our farm. So we can keep it there and we can harvest as much as we want and we make sure nobody else harvests it for us. Very big in Benin, eh? Irvinia. Another one, Dacriodes edulis. 
Safutier. It's mostly found in the west part of uh, Central Africa. It's uh, this fruit, this size. We boil it, salty, tastes like avocado, super nice. Again, look at the number, 8 million US dollars traded annually in Cameroon only. I think in Nigeria it's 5 million. So when we talk about indigenous fruit trees, people think that we're talking about something that nobody cares about. And actually we can see the numbers, eh? It's big numbers and it's often overlooked. Big business. Again, this one also people start to <laughs> get the seedlings from the forest and bring it to their farms. Vita cola. I guess a lot of you would know this one. It's also used as aphrodisiac, can be medicinal, is a stimulant. If you take too much, your heart starts to palpitate. So be careful on the dosage as well. So this one in some parts of Africa, they turn it into nice drinks. So it's not just that you can buy the seeds in the local market. They actually put it in fancy bottles and you can find it in like fancy hotels like we are. And um, this is a small tree. So in this case, there's not a competition from, for timber. And this one, as far as I know, nobody has started to cultivate it. So it's still only harvest from the wild. So this is an important forest resource. And there's a lot of conflict sometimes with uh, local communities when um, in logging concessions because they want to keep their access to this important resource. Another one, Ricinodendron eudeloti. I think this is found up to Tanzania, so parts of East Africa also have it. This kind of brown funny seeds they use to make oil. You can also make it into stews, to soap. The wood is soft, so in this case it doesn't compete the use of timber. And again, only harvest from the wild. For some of you may know the leaf is palmate, Ricinodendron. We found it in DRC as well. Mm -hmm. Next one, star apple. Also common in Benin, Ghana, West Africa. The fruits are eaten raw. It's kind of a soft mango, if we want to call it, plum. And it's used to make a, lot of a local drink, also medicinal. It's not timber because the wood is soft. And in Central Africa, you have another species that I'll show you in a minute from the same ones. Vitex doneana. I guess those from South and East Africa, you know this one. Small fruit, super tasty also used for medicine, sometimes they turn it into wine, and also used for charcoal. So again, if the value of the fruits is high, nobody would bother to turn it into charcoal. If there's something else, maybe that's when they start using it for charcoal. So just to remember, I want to show you two examples from Gabon, uh, where the competing interests, and it's a big issue there, the fact that logging companies cut some of these trees that are also used for food. The first example is Dacryodes bunneri, and it's an important class A timber species. <coughs> so logging companies obviously want to take the best timber out, eh? that's how they make money. So local communities complain a lot because they lose access to one of their food resources. Another example, Longi Rouge, Chrysophyllum lacortianum. This one is the one you have in DRC. It, the fruit is eaten raw, also medicine, problem, important timber. Again, when the logging companies come, they cut the best trees. And I want to point out that usually the bigger trees are the ones that make more fruits. So of course the logging companies cut the trees that are bigger. So we have a problem. So when we think about what is important in terms of fruit trees, we need to know what is out there and how abundant it is. Because in general, people use what is abundant. Eh? You know, if you have to walk in your forest or in your woodland, eh? you, you kind of use what is easy to find, not what is rare. Also, the alternatives, as I said, there's no palm oil in the drylands of West Africa, so they had to find an alternative. They looked into karite. And also, what is the local taste preference? And on the taste, I really like these examples. So these are the fruits of Parinari excelsa, is a forest tree. But in the savannas, in East and South Africa, you have Parinari curatinifolia. It's a little bit sweeter than the excelsa. So in places where you have both, you would rather eat the curatinifolia. But of course, if you had never tasted the curatinifolia, then the Parinari excelsa is good to you. <laughs> so we need to know what is the alternative as well. The same goes with cola. The cola seeds. Cola nitida is the one, the reddish one you can see here. It's commonly traded in West Africa. If you want to get married to a lady in many of the Sahel areas, it depends on how many cola you can give your father, I mean your father-in-law, eh? 
So it's a big value of seed. Not joking. This is there is not about cows, eh? It's about cola nitida. <laughs> and those that been there may confirm that. The problem, if you don't have cola nitida, you may use cola latiritia, which is this smaller seed. Of course, if you have the bigger one, you would not bother with the smaller one. So why are indigenous fruit trees important? And I think it's Nice to think. I mean, I just want to throw it out there for you guys to think. It's, it's important, or maybe important in agroforestry. I'm always shocked when I drive through Rwanda. Man, it's eucalyptus everywhere. What do you do with eucalyptus? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you use it for timber and for poles. Mm -hmm. But the goats cannot use the leaf. It has medicinal purposes. But go and ask the people, in, the aborigines in Australia, how to use them. People here don't know. The fruits cannot be eaten. I mean, to me, it's actually quite useless. Eh? Mm -hmm. So why we don't plant indigenous trees? We can also use them for timber or charcoal, as we saw for karate. But while they grow, we can do something else. So I want to challenge you on that one. Another one is about the protected areas. Let's make a carbon, I mean, if we are thinking about a carbon project, but we have poor people next door that need to make a livelihood, maybe this is an opportunity for them. You know, the trees keep growing. We can maybe sustainably harvest the fruits and help them trade or ferment them or turn it into a bitter cola drink or whatever, so they can have a little source of income. And the last one I want to say is about forest restoration. So maybe when we think about these degraded parts of forest, it could also be a carbon project. Instead of growing a random tree, we could choose an indigenous uh, fruit tree. Maybe the monkeys will come and then we will get the, you know, maybe we can even think on helping for the wildlife. So two quick examples from Uganda. So this is a paper that was recently published. I think it's from the drier part of Uganda. And these were the best uh, or most important fruit trees. Borasum ethiopium, Vitellaria paradoxa, the Shiabata, Tamarindus ignica. I think some of you will know the tamarind, also very appreciated in East Africa. Vitex doniana that I already saw you, and Anona. And we can see how people not just plant, Actually, planting is pretty low. That would be the white bar. People retain. When they clear a farm to farm, if they find one of these trees that are good for them, hey, they don't cut it, they leave it there. Or they can also transplant. So we can see that people value these species and they take care of them in the wild, I mean, or bring them to their gardens. Another study on indigenous fruit trees, this time for Rwanda. So Rwandese colleagues can check the local names the rest, we can just check the scientific. And uh, we can see that, you know, the Parinari is there, the Lanea Shimperi, there's quite a few of them, Miranthus olisti, also widespread in DRC. So we can see Carissa edulis can also be used for medicine, not just the fruits. So we can see that some of these species are not just found in one place, they're actually found across areas. 